Hi, welcome everyone. So I can't quite believe it, but we have 11 days until the 2016 presidential election. <laughs> so here to break down what a long, strange trip it's been are New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Maureen Dowd and the Times Chief Washington Correspondent Carl Hulse. Dowd began her journalism career as an editorial assistant at the Washington Star and later joined the New York Times as a metropolitan correspondent in 1983. Three years later, she moved to the Times Washington Bureau to report on politics, serving as the Times, Washington, as the Times White House correspondent and a columnist for the Times Magazine. In addition to covering seven presidential campaigns, Dowd has also authored two New York Times bestsellers, including Bush World, Enter at Your Own Risk, and Are Men Necessary When Sexes Collide? Dowd's latest <laughs> book, The Year of Voting Dangerously, chronicles the ups and downs of this turbulent election cycle. Carl Hulse, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of the Hill, has worked at the New York Times for over three decades. In addition to his current role as the Times Chief Washington Correspondent, Hulse is the Managing Editor of First Draft and writes a weekly column for the Times called On Washington. Joining Dowd and Hulse to moderate the discussion is Institute of Politics Director David Axelrod. And before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, there will be time for questions after the discussion with the microphone in the back of the room. And Dowd will also be signing copies of her new book downstairs after the event. So we are thrilled to have these political journalists here with us at the Institute of Politics for what will surely be a lively and enlightening conversation. So please join me in welcoming Maureen Dowd, Carl Hulse, and David Axelrod. Normally, we, we weren't sure what the configuration was going to be here. Normally, I would get to introduce the introducer. So let me uh, say a word about Liz, who's been with us from the time she was a first year and has been a leader in the IOP. And when I was handed the notes to introduce her, uh, I focused on the fact that you're a fourth year now and you're going to be leaving at the end of this year, which is the worst thing about being part of the IOP because all these splendid people come through and then you leave, which I deeply <laughs> resent. But thank you so much for everything that you've done for the IOP. Uh, and uh, I urge you all afterwards to uh, pick up Maureen's book. She tells me that she's brought a Cubs pen to sign the book with, <laughs> which I think shows a good spirit. Uh, the Year of Voting Dangerously, a great title. I don't know how you arrived at that. But, it was seamless. <laughs> but uh, you said America got mad and went mad. What, what, what happened this year? You've covered many presidential elections. What made this one different? Actually, I'm sad to say it's nine. Um, so I have to update my resume. It's nine presidential elections in high heels and high dudgeon. And, um, <laughs> you know, in 2008, where I met David, and David and I bonded because we were sitting on the bus together when the announcement about Sarah Palin came down. And we both looked at each other, and, and David goes, this is either going to be really good or really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Turn out bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Not for um, you particularly. No. No. <laughs> so um, I didn't think there could be a race as fascinating as 2008 because that race had everything. It had race and the other kind of race and gender and um, it had a, a, like a Game of Thrones plot with the young African-American prince usurping the queen of the kingdom. I, I just thought it was, I, I was on the road for two years because I, I couldn't stop watching. It was amazing. But that race was nothing compared to this race because, you know, as Stefan says when he reviews a disco on Saturday Night Live, this race has everything. <laughs> this race has Russian hackers, white supremacists, feuding Kardashian, you know, Twitter wars, dueling federal investigations, small hands. <laughs> Whatever and, that means. And for the first time, it has um, 
not one but two candy companies denouncing <laughs> the Republican nominee. Uh, you know, Tic Tacs for obvious reasons and Skittles because uh, his son compared refugees to Skittles in a, another very um, heartwarming, genteel Trump family moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and on top of all that, it's got Julian Assange locked in a ladies' room in the Ecuadorian embassy, <laughs> having his internet taken away. So I know a lot of people are eager for this campaign to be over, but just purely from a journalistic point of view as opposed to a citizen point of view, it's really a remarkable thing to behold. And I say that as someone who had to spend a year with Michael Dukakis, <laughs> asking him about his favorite reading, which was a book called Swedish Land Use Planning. <laughs> 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 so this one is pretty med mesmerizing and dreadful at the same time. Well, you know, I hear political reporters are all exhausted, right? All the people who are on the road, they're like, oh, a few more days, I have to get through this. I'm like, you should just embrace this. It's never going to get any better for you. So if you're into writing about politics, but, they are, but they're getting tired. Yeah. I think the American people are getting tired. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of a, gr a grinding affair, d despite everything that all the elements, Maureen, that you speak of. You spent some time with Donald Trump uh, over the years. Have you ever asked him what his favorite book was? Oh, well, he's never read a presidential biography. Mm -hmm. um, this writer I was just interviewing for a magazine piece I'm doing said um, that it, it's about similarities between Bill Clinton and Trump, and this writer said that Trump was Bill without the dictionary. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, so he's never read, yeah, he has no, he has a couple of issues, but he has no real ideology mm -hmm. and he doesn't study. I mean, you know, if I were... I don't know what you meant when you said he had a couple of issues. But. Well, I mean, he has immigration. <laughs> no, I know. Oh, oh, he has <laughs> yeah. those issues, too. <laughs> but, you know, the really interesting thing when I look back on my career is sometimes I've interviewed people like Colin Powell and Mario Cuomo, who you'd think would make great presidential candidates. And... They, because they are first generation, you know, their parents were immigrants, they kind of are so amazed at where they got in the world that they didn't want to make a further jump. And, and you know, I sat in Mario Cuomo's office when he had the two planes waiting outside to go for that campaign. And he just, he gave me a copy of Teilhard de Chardin and did all this Jesuitical reasoning about how he wasn't worthy and maybe he wasn't worthy. So Trump and didn't do this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so W and Sarah Palin and Dan Quayle and Trump just assume that it doesn't matter what they know. I mean, if that were me and I fell into Clover like those guys, I would be studying 12 hours a day like Liza Doolittle. But they just figure, well, you know, they got it by winging it, so keep winging it. Carl, you, uh, you are the sort of uh, gray eminence of congr gray. congressional, uh, at least you've got hair, brother, <laughs> uh, of uh, congressional reporters. Um, and you were there, uh, were you there? You were there for some of Hillary's tenure. Yeah, all of it, actually. And uh, what, was your, what were your impressions of her when, uh, from that period? Well, you know, it was interesting because she came in, it was a classic Hillary Clinton approach, very calculated and studied, but she wanted to do the right thing. She wanted to come in, be one of the boys, not get national attention, right? She wanted, I'm the new senator from New York, I'm going to work on New York issues. She actually created a little arc that other people have since copied. You want to come in and seem uh, dedicated. Yeah. But at the Obama same, consulted with her on this. Yeah, I mean, this was a thing that, uh, just a quick aside on that, when I met Obama the first day he was there and we had an exchange. Actually, it was funny because I said, he asked me where I'm from, I said LaSalle County. He said, I, I, he goes, well, I did pretty well in LaSalle County. I said, you weren't running against Everett Dirksen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I walked away from him, and uh, there was another reporter there, and she said, what did you think of him? I said, that guy's running for president. Uh, but I wish you had told me. I yeah, well, I could have told, <laughs> I, I told you immediately. But, so, but everything she did, was, it was sort of plotted out, right? But she did it. She, you know, she showed that she could work with McCain. She'd go on these trips. 
and uh, she cultivated a pretty good reputation in the Senate. I think that even in the Obama White House, they think there's a possibility if she's president, she can do better with Congress than uh, your former what do you think? boss. I think I think that's true, actually. I mean, I think you know you were inside the White House more than I. I think you know there was a certain element of frustration with the Congress. I think she's sort of willing to try and fight through that. Like there was Burma is a huge itch issue for Mitch McConnell, right? So when she was, uh, Mark Landler writes about this in his book, uh, a colleague, of the, also of the Times. Right. When she wanted to do something as Secretary of State with Burma, she went to McConnell's office. And I know this sounds small, but those are the kind of gestures that mean something on Capitol Hill. It's a power thing, like, I'm going to go to your office and talk to you about that. Mitch McConnell himself has said that he finds her smart and capable. So, uh, you know, we'll just have to see how it goes. I mean, we, we, we talked. Um, you and I just uh, sat down for a podcast. By the way, I did one with Maureen, and you guys should catch up with the Axe Files with Maureen Dowd because it was it was a fun conversation. We talked about uh, the fact that McConnell made a strategic judgment before Obama was president, and the fact that the Republican Party, because it is so divided now, the one thing they seem to be able to agree on is they don't like Barack Obama and they don't like Hillary Clinton. So. Uh, isn't she going to face some of the same yeah, kind yeah. of dynamics yeah. that Obama did? Uh, I totally. I think. I, in fact, I just, if she wins, I should say yeah. that. I, mean, I wrote a story this I actually week. My believe column. in the <laughs> the electoral in the, process. Uh, in the electoral process. Yes. <laughs> the uh, I wrote a column this week saying, you know, talking about what was going to happen uh, potentially after the election, and one of the uh, Republicans I talked to said she's coming in with nothing like Obama's popularity at that time. <laughs> And so, and they were willing to take him on. So I don't, I think that she's in for a tough road. I think she can try and crack it. I think she would have more luck in the Senate than the House where they're just going to be investigating her for two years. You know, the articles of impeachment are already being drawn up. Uh, so I, I, I keep telling crowds this, I hate to be so depressing, but I'm not seeing any big breakthrough in relationships between the, uh, Congress if Hillary's elected. And it probably On the other hand, the Cubs this, are in the World yeah, Series. So, you know, <laughs> so everything else is, is, yeah. is secondary. But I uh, think if Trump were in, you know, there'd also be the same crazy conflicts, too, honestly. Or and maybe more, yeah. because he has conflicts both with his own party and... And his understanding of the power of the Congress, I think, is actually not what it should be for a president. <laughs> this uh, may get back to the reading Maureen issue. and I had lunch with him uh, a few months ago, a long lunch without staff, which it's hard to believe. And at the beginning, I was talking, we were talking about Paul Ryan. I said, well, you know, he hasn't gotten his budget through. And Trump is like, really? <laughs> Yeah. What's, what's that mean? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of fundamental. Yeah. That's a little <laughs> chilling. Yeah. Uh, Maureen, what, what, is going, what is going on in the country uh, that allowed uh, Trump to rise and become the nominee of the Republican Party? And what is it about all of us? And I was the one, I, you quoted me as saying, you know, it's going to fade by winter and so on. So, I mean, I'm the first to admit failure on this, in this regard. What does it say about sort of the elite opinion world that we missed it? Didn't, didn't you say that he wouldn't make it to the, uh, well, the, the uh, talent portion of the beauty contest? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I said I thought he was doing witticism. well in the swimsuit competition. Yeah, the swimsuit but competition. Uh, I just was trying to put it in an idiom that was sort of part of Trump's world. It turned out beauty contests actually figured into the race. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> but the point was that you do get judged by a higher standard as you move along. He's gotten very, very far. Uh, what is it about the country? that allows Donald Trump to have made the progress that he's made. I mean, yeah, he's the first I mean, guy who's not been in government, not been right. in the military, you know, doesn't have the traditional credentials. Well, there's always a longing in the populace for a strong outsider. You know, that's the plot of Coriolanus. And the I always feel inadequate when I... <laughs> <laughs> and then the problem she, she is... She doesn't just do this at the University <laughs> of Chicago. She actually puts us in her columns and stuff. But then the problem is that those people don't understand how to make the system work, so sometimes they collapse. But, I mean, watching Trump was like watching, um, in a simpler metaphor, a bank robber. 
you know, go I into a bank and find, for some crazy reason, all the doors open and no guards there. And that's what watching Trump was like, because at the debates, even he seemed shocked, like that somebody wasn't <laughs> taking him out. And I think right now he's stunned. I, I just think he's probably stunned more than any of us are flabbergasted that he is where he is. But I think that... Do you think he wants to be president? Well, this is a difficult answer because it sounds like psychobabble, but he is self-destructive, but he's not trying to self-destruct, if, if you get that distinction. He self-destructs because he's a clinical narcissist and he can't stop himself, and celebrity is like his heroin, and he's kind of like in a heroin overdose now, and he... <laughs> Every rejection is a small death. Every humiliation is a small death that he has to lash out at. So he doesn't have the tools, really, to run a presidential race, much less, you know, <coughs> like he hasn't fed his brain the right thing, but he doesn't have the emotional tools to do it. But the reason it happened, I think, this is my part where I kind of defend, you know, in the book I have essays by my conservative siblings about why they're going to vote for Trump. And if you read them, you know, and they're always jumping on and off the train when Trump does something indefensible. But if you read the essays, uh, you can kind of get a window into what Paul Ryan must be thinking and how hard it is for mm -hmm. him right now. And I Because think sometimes Trump behaves and sometimes he doesn't. And, and when he behaves and, and acts in a more traditional way, it's easier for Republicans to support him when he acts out. Right. It's harder. And, well, it's like being handcuffed to a hurricane. You know, they don't, nobody knows minute to minute when he's going to do something like that all night tweet thing about Miss Universe that's just, or Putin, <laughs> this Putin stuff that's going to put the Republicans in this really bad position. But my only defense of Trump voters is, yes, there's a lot of racism that got stirred up by the election of the first African-American president and a lot of sexism that's getting stirred up by the uh, run of the first woman on a major party ticket. So there's a lot of racism and sexism. And if you look at the scroll besides the YouTube thing of Trump rallies, it's really scary and disgusting. But there are also normal Republican voters who do not want to vote for Hillary Clinton and who want conservative Supreme Court, who are not racist and sexist. And in general, I would say that American <coughs> citizens have a right to be really angry because we went into a misbegotten war without anyone knowing the difference between Sunni and Shia. We, the economy almost collapsed. No one even knew what a derivative was. Uh, globalization was presented as this bright, shiny thing. There weren't going to be any problems, and no one noticed when white swaths of people did have problems. So, you know, there are rage rooms opening all over the country where you can go and destroy a TV set with a baseball <coughs> bat. And to some of these people, Trump is the baseball bat. You know, to me, David, just to add something there, I think one of the surprising things about this campaign to me is the depth of the anger, right? You know, you look at the unemployment numbers, the steady job growth, payrolls up, you know, where we live, things are pretty good, right? right? You know, and it, it's, you know, everybody's... Well, what, about, what about Ottawa? Well, see, that, that's the thing. There are parts of the country that do feel like they were left <clears throat> out of, you know, the slow-moving recovery, but I think they also, there's just this big element who feels this country is just becoming something they're not familiar with, right? It's just big societal changes that they're having a hard time with. And I think that the the extent to that has driven Trump. And it's, it's made it, uh, I, there's a lot of angry people out there. And you know, funnily enough, this is something I learned just because I'm doing this magazine piece. One of the first person to see, one of the first people to see that Trump would have this appeal about wage stagnation and these other things was Bill Clinton. He said sooner than anyone, yeah, this guy could attract this cohort. Carl, you, uh, Maureen referenced her siblings and this sort of approach, aversion relationship they've had with Trump throughout this race. You cover these congressional, uh, these members of Congress who are running for re-election, and you've seen them yo-yo back and forth. How hard has it been 
uh, for them. I mean, it's been so painful to watch, right? You know, I'm for Trump, I'm against Trump, I'm for Trump. I think it's, it's really uh, pulled them in all sorts of directions. We were talking Joe Heck, who is a very important Senate candidate, Republican in Nevada. Congressman. Right, Congressman now, former general, uh, and I think he actually might still be a general in the reserves. And he's been all over the place on Trump, and I think it could ultimately cost him the election. I think that, as I said to you earlier, I think that some Republicans are still discovering that they don't understand their constituents, right? There was a few who came out immediately after the Access Hollywood tape. I love that that's now a thing, the Access Hollywood tape. Uh, and, you know, said, well, we can't have a... Uh, Republican nominee like that. I mean, look who they're used to. E Mitt Romney, Reagan, people who would, Bush even, never, ever speak like that. They think of themselves as these upstanding community members, right? Uh, you know, usually some sort of religious uh, association. So to them, this was unthinkable. And then all of a sudden, they find out their constituents are like really mad that they're abandoning Trump. They're like, I think some of them are in, in a bit of shock, like, who are our actual voters? I actually think that um, one thing we're going to have to evaluate after this is just how, you know, we, we talk about inequality, we talk about <laughs> um, the sort of divisions within our economy, and our, but it's also influenced, I think, our ability to understand each other uh, and the, the, the fact that people were so detached from the experience of your neighbors in Ottawa who write and interpret these things, I think is part of why we had um, the disconnect that we've had. Maureen, you also spent many years covering the Clintons. Mm -hmm. um, talk to her. Uh, you, you talk about Trump as a character. W talk about Hillary Clinton as a character in this drama. Yeah, my in the book, I start with her when she is um, running as Bill's wife in 92. And, you know, I was a news <coughs> reporter then. And when I went back to put together for the book, I was really shocked. And some interviews have asked me if I had a girl crush on her because I'm so supportive of her because I could see she was chafing. And I do feel with women like Hillary and Michelle who have the same educational credentials as their husbands and some of the same you know, qualifications, it's very hard for them to go into this little antiquated satin box of the first lady dumb. And she would even fight the title. She didn't want to be called, she wanted it to be called first mate. And, you know, she it's wanted that shape, West I Wing think. office. Yes, and, it's like man you know, overboard. Right. So I was very, <laughs> I was very supportive because I, I did understand. And during that race, she got some stationery that said, Hillary Clinton and it dropped the Rodham, which had been a painful fight for her in Arkansas, and she sent it back. And, you know, she was constantly chafing in a way you don't visibly see Michelle Obama do. And it just, I, I felt very positive about her. And when she presented health care, I said it was dazzling and there could be all these problems because if you put a spouse in charge of 16% of the economy who doesn't really have a specific title or is an elected official, you know, it could be dangerous because then sycophants won't want to tell the president's wife, you know, what she should know. And indeed, that's what happened. And that's where you saw Trump has his wall, but she has her wall of secrecy and defensiveness. Where, where is the, what, what is that? What is the genesis of that? Yeah, well, you had the best best line about it, the allergy That's to what I was hoping you'd say transparency. <laughs> you know, I, I just think she had a rough time in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. You know, she had to completely give herself a sort of southern makeover to help her husband get elected again and, and tamp down the feminism. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Hard. You listen to that tape, uh, the famous 60 Minutes mm -hmm. interview, and the, six, the sort of distinctly southern right. mm -hmm. lil, right. uh, uh, tinge to her speech. Right. Southern Park Ridge. Right? Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, when she got to Washington, they had a really rough time. And, you know, Whitewater and George Stephanopoulos, I was rereading all the biographies of her, and George Stephanopoulos said if he could have a genie come out of a bottle and change one thing about his time with the Clintons, he would insist to her that she turn the Whitewater papers over to the Washington Post because he said it would have been over in a week. But instead, because of this wall of secrecy and um, paranoia that tends to set her 
her foes and the press into this frenzy where they think she's hiding something and then Rose Law Firm records appear and disappear and emails appear and disappear and they're bleached and they're back. So it starts this frenzy and then it's like, you know, Alfred Hitchcock used to have that word of MacGuffin, something that drives the plot in a fake way. You're not even sure what the beginning thing was or how serious <laughs> it was because you're in this plot that's like hurtling like a train down the track. So Whitewater, Stephanopoulos thinks would have been over in a week. Instead, it led to 80 million in federal investigations and eight or nine federal prosecutors and impeachment. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think her success in the White House will depend on if she's able to dismantle a little bit the paranoid side and get rid of Sidney Blumenthal and David Brock and people who, these attack dogs, who feed that side. But I've never seen people get less paranoid in the White House, so. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I think you would argue, I mean, you, it's indisputable that this would be a different race right now, but for her decision to go the private route on her email, which is just the, it, the her numbers were positive before that story surfaced and they've been underwater ever since and it's a story that can, to this day apparently continues uh, to dog her. You know my thought on that, it, it, I, I, half of me agrees with you, half of me says it would have been something else. They'll find something else. That's our politics now, right? They're going to get in there and find something. People say to me, uh, Bernie Sanders would have been, you know, he'd be killing Trump and running a much different race. He didn't have anything. You know what? There would be something. They would just be pounding and pounding and pounding him on. I don't know what it is, and it's hard to <laughs> figure it out. But uh, Right, but part of the reason Obama's approval ratings are going up and up in comparison to Trump and Hillary is because everyone looks and they think, oh, my gosh, this guy had no shadows for eight years. He had no ethical shadows. He had no family shadows. And they're kind of giving him a laurel for that, which is well deserved. So, the, I, I, yeah, that he whole. Would, he would be the first to also say that the reason, part of the reason his numbers are going up is that the, the whole sort of attack machine shifted to Hillary Clinton and away from him. Yeah. And he's not under the constant attack that he was under. But that's the, the bad dynamic the Clintons have where they feed you know, the people who want to go after them, they feed them stuff to go after them. They can never pull out of that negative symbiosis. Like, who gets a private server, you know, when you're the Secretary of State? That is a, a complete metaphor for paranoia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she started on the Watergate Committee as a young lawyer, so she should know how dangerous paranoia and giving in to paranoia is and being surrounded by creepy people. No, she's paranoid because of that. Now. So that is the full Well, circle. you know the old saying that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean someone, no, someone's and not there out are to people you. you know? Out yeah. for, you know, I just wanted to, something you mentioned earlier, it's like that parts of the country not... We're going to take some questions, and I guess we're going to take them from there. So if you have questions and you can squeeze over there, Get, get over there now. So that not understanding, and to me that's one of the big ironies of, of this whole thing. It's like we're more connected, there's more social media, all this is going on, but everybody's in their own box, right? Nobody understands anything of, of the other side. It's, it's really uh, kind of And you said that this is one of the big changes that you've seen over your 30 years yeah, in yeah. Washington. It's just that, you know, I think one of the things that as a reporter and growing up in a little town in Illinois that you kind of go, what I've always tried to do is like uh, not look at both sides as these total <coughs> crackpots and you know that everybody's right or wrong but nobody does that and I think the media is even shifting to a much more partisan mode you know yeah for what that's so, I could these are two of the smartest people around and I could talk to them forever but I want to be selfish so let's go to questions hi my name is Matt Enlow I'm a second year student at the law school I'm curious what good you luck what? Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I'm curious what you both think has been the most significant driving force in this election and how you think uh, the Senate and the House will play in the future given these events. Well, you, you go on the... You can go. I'll do the Senate and House. You answer the driving force. <laughs> well, what do you think the driving force is? Anger. Anger. I mean, upset people. I think Trump, though, here's a funny thing. I think Trump was really benefited from that huge Republican field. 
<coughs> I think if there would have been a smaller field that he would have had uh, a much <coughs> more difficult time. They just divided the votes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's just, just this running resentment and anger in the country right now that's fueling this. But I, as I said it a little bit ago, you know, when I walk around, everybody's got a nice new smartphone and uh, things don't look so bad. And then, but everybody else says it's an apocalypse. So I think there's a major division. I, I, as far as the House and Senate, I think right now the Democrats have a slight edge in the Senate races to take back the House. And I think that that situation in Nevada is really crucial. Uh, the House, it would be, it would take a big uh, collapse by Trump. To, to flip. They don't have enough seats in play. Uh, I think even Dold here is, he'll probably lose, but he's probably running pretty well. I think that, uh, and Trump's numbers are actually coming back a bit right now, so I don't see it. I do think that in some ways you guys haven't experienced the election here in Illinois because it's not any kind of battleground, so you're not getting like bombarded with ads. So if you want that, you should probably go to Des Moines or something for a week and just spend the last We're week We're getting there. bombarded with ads, but they're for state legislators yeah. because the governor and the speaker are in a death death struggle. Well, so here. those are even more boring. I'm yeah, sorry. They are. That. They know it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, but just before we get to the next question, explain what the implications of a smaller House will be for Ryan's well, ability to control his call. Paul conflict. Ryan, you know, he's just in a terrible situation. I'm sure he's sitting up there in Janesville and his head's just exploding every day, you know. Uh, but he is a Cubs fan, so I'm going to put it there. So, the, uh, so what's going to happen to Paul Ryan? He's going to have, he's got a, a like 60 seat majority now. He's going to have, uh, a, they need 30 seats to, to, to take it back. But he's going to end up with like a five or six or ten seat majority, and it's going to be a lot more conservative. So here's a guy who's going to have to make deals with the Democrats to do the basic fundamentals of government, but he's going to face all this pressure from the angry uh, people on his right, the Freedom Caucus. So he's really got a thankless task, especially if he wants to run for president in 2020. Kind of and at the same time, if Trump were to win, Trump hates Paul Ryan. Right. <laughs> so I don't know how that would go. Uh, but I think it's going to be the House will be, uh, you know, the thing to watch. If anything can happen, it'll happen in the House. But like I said, they're already lining up the investigation. It's kind of ironic to be enslaved by the Freedom Caucus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I'm Colette. I'm a first year student at Harris School of Public Policy. And um, I was, you guys are talking a lot about how anger has fueled Trump's rise. And I kind of want to know um, how you guys think the media has shaped his rise. I've read several articles on the Times that, you know, say that and kind of how we've become desensitized to all these scandals. Well, if it was in the Times, it must be true, right? <laughs> <laughs> How we've been desensitized? Well, kind of, I mean, the more that comes out about him, it's like not surprising. Well, that's true. What right. do you think about that? Uh, well, I was just, right as I was coming over, I was reading, I guess our executive editor, Dean Becquet, was kind of taking CNN to task for hiring Corey Lewandowski and uh, Fox to task for being Fox. <laughs> Although he excluded Megyn Kelly and Chris Wallace from being chastised. And, um, you know, on the one hand, um, I think that liberals think that the media hasn't done enough to expose Donald Trump because they can't understand how you could possibly vote for Donald Trump. That's why I highly recommend reading My Siblings, because to them, Hillary Clinton is the apocalypse. So some liberals refuse to accept that. They just think we haven't made it clear. And you know, all of my colleagues, the columnists, it's so funny, every time I pick up the paper, they're going on these Margaret Mead expeditions to find Trump voters and reason with them. And if we can track one down and they all end up at the same cafe in Kentucky <laughs> and I just have to go home <laughs> and uh, so I think the media you know part of it is people thinking we should have been harder when we have you just need to Google Donald Trump you'll see everything you want including David Fahrenheit's amazing reporting in the Washington Post on his you know foundation corruption and um, yeah so I just think part of it is that and part of it is you know, the press was so angry when 
he was going to make a birther announcement. And then he invited them over and showed them around the Washington Post Office Hotel, which isn't doing that well because it has his name on it. And then, really um, yeah, and really big letters. We're and familiar with that here in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. And so then they all said, we've been played. But if they didn't know they were being invited there to do an infomercial for Trump's hotels, then they're not even reading their own newspapers. Because they should know by now that that's who he is. And he's getting more desperate about his brand. So there's going to be more of that. But I do think, in some ways, your premise is right. And it's even right on Republicans. I think. And I mentioned this to David earlier. I think one of the things that's driving <laughs> Trump's numbers back up a bit is that he hasn't done anything terrible or said anything in about three or four days, right? <laughs> so there isn't some big headline. And so Republicans kind of go, uh, well, maybe he's not so bad. I haven't read anything terrible in the past few days, and I can't stand Hillary. Maybe I'll, I'll do that. I actually think that, you know, that this barrage of things, I mean, it's hard to believe that after the access Hollywood right. tape, right? I mean, but everybody that night, oh, he's going to have to pull out two days later. It's like, I didn't really mean that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the, the thing, this was true before the first debate. He, he had a bad August where he was reacting to the conventions, and he went kind of nuts for three weeks. And then he had this new team, and he was under control, and he was reading off a prompter, and he started recovering. And then he was provoked in the debates to right. misbehave again. Now there are no more debates. And so there's a little bit more of an opportunity for, for him to just be quiet. To, to be Although, quiet. I mean, he still says stuff. Like, what did he say yesterday? Oh, we should just forget the election and appoint me yes. because my policies are so good. It's like, has anyone ever heard that in the closing days of a yeah. presidential campaign? Usually you go, please vote for me. Not like, oh, let's just do away with your right to vote and just make me the guy. I mean, yes. it is kind of, but, but that's like, nothing compared to some of the other stuff. It's next, weird. Next, next question. So uh, another thing about... <laughs> Introduce yourself. Oh, here. yeah. I'm Ronan Shatsky. I'm a first year at the college. Uh, another thing about how the media has been treating Trump is that, um, as has been said frequently, he's been getting so much coverage all the time from the moment he announced. And uh, it's partly because, obviously, people will watch you know, your TV show or they'll pick up your newspaper if it's got a big picture of Trump on it. People, are, people like to hear about him. Um, so it just raises the question whether, like, is there, is there still an incentive to actually report news that's happening that's substantive? Has there ever been? Why is it different now? Why is it all of a sudden turned to so little content and so much focusing on this guy who used the press to run for, run for president as successfully as he's done? Well, partly the reason is there isn't much content in covering Trump is because he has no content, right? He's post-substance, so how we're not going to analyze his tax plan. He's having an emotional breakdown on the political stage. We've never seen that before. Lots of times in modern history, presidents have been mentally unbalanced, like LBJ's aides used to argue about whether he was a manic depressive or a paranoid. You know, JFK and Nixon had psychotropic drugs in the medicine cabinet, but this guy is having a pre-breakdown. <laughs> so that's a huge story in politics. So, um, and I agree with Matt Taibbi and Rolling Stone, where a lot of these complaints are coming from people who want it censored. I mean, he, yes, used Twitter to rise, but then Twitter caused him to fall. He used TV to rise, but TV has called to, caused him to fall. So I have more faith in the voters that, you know, if they see things, they're going to be able to analyze it and get the whole picture. Maureen will be back on November 9th to check in on how the voters did. <laughs> I mean, to me, you know, he is the nominee of, of a major party, and, you know, we have to give him all the coverage he's going to get. But there's no doubt that he drives audience and that's a big thing in the media right now both print and so you're looking for audience I think a big test will be after he if he loses after November 8th what does CNN do David's one of David's well, employers well I mean are no, gonna I, keep gonna, <coughs> gonna keep at Trump or not well I guess the bigger question to me in a really artful deflection of your question <laughs> is <laughs> for you Maureen uh, knowing uh, given your observation of him and everything that you've said here, what are the odds that he's going to go quietly into the night on November 9th? 
Yeah, this is interesting because no one agrees yeah, with me. Dodge, no right. one, yeah, no I one, know. no I, one agrees. I admitted it up front. <laughs> you can't trust the media. <laughs> no one agrees with me on this. I think he's gonna um, hit the earth like a giant orange fiery comet, and we're not gonna hear from him again. I mean, yes, Access Hollywood may go and interview him. What does he think of what Hillary did about this or that? But. I think his brand is ruined. They've already come up with a new name for their new hotels called Scion. You know, they're boycotting Ivanka's clothing brand, and I think they're going to have to come to terms with that, first of all. And they can start this TV show, but I talked to Les Moonves, who also said the head Chairman of, of CBS. Yeah, who admitted that you know, Trump made them a lot of money. But he said it's not that easy to put together this kind of TV thing that they're thinking of. And also, who's the audience? He can go around and talk to white supremacists, but is that really what Donald Trump wants to do? So I think he's going to have a really hard time afterwards. I mean, one of the conflicts he has is that his political constituency is one thing, right. and his commercial constituency yeah. is right. another. Right, so the people can't yeah, afford, the people who love him are not going to go stay, you know, a night hotel. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a colleague who canceled out of one of his Scottish golf courses and, and paid 5000 penalty because he said he just won't go there. And I have some friends who were going to go on a tour of Virginia wine country and they told the driver not to go to Trump's winery, which he doesn't have anything to do with. So like at Trump Place in New York, this week they have given the doormen new uniforms without Trump's name taken his name off the welcome mats and they're calling themselves the Riverside Place building. So we met over at the new oh, Trump yeah. Hotel in Washington uh, maybe for thinking about a story from there and it, it's the old post office building beautiful it was totally underutilized so I was waiting for Maureen and I'm standing out in front of course the typical big Trump name and there's this African-American family that's there and they're taking pictures and I'm like this is interesting and they get under the name and I'm, I'm watching them they get under the name and the person taking the picture and then they all go like that. <laughs> and, I, and I said that's their Christmas card right there <laughs> they're gonna set that out it was really funny other student questions before we get to you young at heart people Hello, my name is Matt Tom Kovic I'm a PhD student in political science you gotta speak up here just, uh, we can hear you. Go ahead. Matt Just, Tomkowiak, yeah. I'm a PhD student in political science. Uh, for a long time, it seems like American politics has kind of been organized around the question of federalism and states' rights. And the Republican Party was sort of the party that defended state rights. And in fact, they, they've been better at organizing for state legislative elections, better at organizing for governor elections. But in this election cycle, there's sort of been no discussion of federalism or state rights. And instead, really, the energy in the Republican Party seems to be around kind of this global elite that's trying to take over our national government. In some sense, it's almost as if these people want a stronger <coughs> federal government to protect us from, the, from this kind of elite global government. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, do you think that we've sort of have reached a certain consensus around the issue of federalism in America? And we're sort of we're having a hard time digesting this election because there's this new conflict arising that we don't quite know how to argue about, uh, and that is that one side maybe wants to have more open borders, uh, wants to have more international institutions, and the other one, the other side wants a strong nation that defends us from these global elites. You are a PhD. <laughs> uh, I think that is an effect. Uh, an, uh, an effect of globalization that we think differently. Uh, here, but here's my take on states' rights. States' rights is always an issue that's convenient. You know, you're for states' rights when it helps you. You know, and the Republicans have just a lengthy li list of hypocrisy on this. You know, you're for states' rights when it helps you. You're against. You're for national. Uh, of issues when that helps you. I mean, I think our politics are changing and moving beyond some of the standard things we used to argue about, whether it's permanent or not, I don't know. And it sort of becomes of the moment. And Trump has just said uh, a lot of things during this campaign that would totally be anathema to normal Republican politics, like even to the fact that, you know, he wanted to institute some national policing stuff, which is like, by far the most local of issues. So, and, you know, and, and the most inflammatory for yeah. conservatives. Fact is that uh, the reason conservatives are uncomfortable with him primarily is that he wants to consolidate power right. in the executive and they're uh, 
that that's antithetical to their whole yeah. concept. And trade. I mean, that's another. I mean, it kind of goes to that. I mean, you know, these were totally. There's probably no more Republican issue in Washington than free trade. Right now, they've totally turned that on its head. So, uh, but whether this is an outlier, I don't know. Right. Is sort of more towards maybe a stronger executive that can protect them. But the elites include elite conservative commentators, not just uh, just center right yeah. corporate ben, Republicans. I mean, you look at you look, you talk to you talk to the Eric Ericsons of the world, and they feel they they fear an overweening executive, uh, and they're concerned about that, and that's their objection uh, to to uh, Trump. Any other student questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Anna. I'm a second year student in the college. Um, my question is about um, the idea of rural voters and how the Democrat Party platform seems to have moved away from the classic, like addressing the needs of blue collar workers, it has focused more on social and urban issues. Do you think that Trump's kind of success with that block, as we've talked about, will change the way the Democratic Party looks at those issues? Or do you think that's kind of something that'll fade into the Republican Party? Or well, David should actually talk a lot about this in some ways because this is right up his uh, alley and with President Obama. I think there are a lot of people, and Joe Biden being a leader among them, who thinks that the Democratic Party has moved too far away from addressing some of these more blue-collar, uh, labor-type issues that uh, used to be the core of the Democratic Party. That's what you're talking about, right? And that they've gotten too far away from there into sort of the urban, in some ways, elite audience. And there is a shift going on in who, who the parties are trying to appeal to. I think you do see the Republican Party going after those people and like labor and used to be, you know, they were the big business party. I think we're in the midst of this pretty big shift and, you know, 20 years from now, some of you guys in this room are going to be writing your books about it. But yeah, I would just say the old paradigms have to change because we're going through times of revolutionary change, particularly <coughs> in the global economy. And the fact is that uh, more technology than globalization has marginalized large numbers of middle class jobs that didn't require huge amounts of education. And it's created a lot of dislocation at the same time that we see these demographic changes, changes in the way we communicate. Uh, and But ultimately, Either party, if they're going to be successful, better be responsive to these economic changes because if we lose the ability to say to people in America, if you work hard, you can get ahead uh, and that, you know, you have a chance, uh, that's going to be, that, that is a very, very disruptive uh, development. And I'll just give you one example. I had Fareed Zakaria on my podcast and he, he pointed out that we, we now are moving toward driverless cars seems to be something that's going to come online fairly soon. There are three million people in this country who make a living driving cars, driving cars, driving trucks, driving buses. What happens to them? <laughs> the, these are the issues that, frankly, we should be the center of our discussion in a national campaign if we were having the kind of campaign that, that we need. Uh, next question. Thank you. student here. Um, this isn't explicitly a question, but I couldn't resist given what you, you all have been Try talking and put about. a question mark at the end of it. All right, yeah. I will. 28 minutes ago, my New York Times alert said the FBI has found new emails related to its Hillary Clinton inquiry and will review, quote, whether they contain classified information. So I don't know if you want yeah, to Yeah, we were reading that. that just as no, we yeah. came in. I mean, apparently we get the same feed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to be a lot of really bad headlines for Hillary Clinton for the next few days, and they're going to spend a lot of time trying to explain why that's not a big deal, which is not what they want to be doing at the end of this campaign. I think it's bad news for her. Now, whether or not it's going to have an impact, if there's enough time. Back in the day, there would never be enough time for that story to take hold and change the campaign. Now it changes so fast. I think that that, I don't even know much about the details of that but I know it's not good for her. What does it mean after the election? Well, then, then you just have more fuel on the fire of the House investigations, right? They're, they're like, look, even the FBI uh, it, it reopened it. We, you know, we're totally legit. It's not like the Republicans in, in the House are going to say, oh, you won the election. 
you know, we'll drop everything. Let's just have a clean slate moving forward. You know, that ain't happening. So, uh, I mean, that's that's fuel for the fire. I so, think Maureen, you're, you're, this is a continuation of the storyline you were talking about with Hillary and the whole being sort of, you talked about Trump's self-destructiveness. This this fur, this kind of furtiveness has been a element yeah, of self-destruction for I know. I mean, the her. most horrible thing that would happen is if we had another Clinton impeachment, <laughs> you know? But the interesting thing about what we learn in these emails is that the things that columnists like me worry about with Hillary are the things her own staff or the staffers that came over from Obama worry about. It's the exact same thing, that she won't apologize or doesn't understand what's wrong with having your own server when you're the Secretary of State, that, you know, Podesta and Neera Tandon said that her, you know, <coughs> that her uh, judgment was uh, not good. And, you know, so they worry about the stuff that we worry about, which is, it's just weird um, that all the same things. And why didn't she get on top of the email things sooner and why, you know, was she so secretive and why does she surround herself with these creepy attack dogs who play to her paranoid side. So Podesta and Neera Tandon are sitting there going through the same fears that we have as journalists about her. You know, I should say that no campaign in the history of this country would not have been discomfited by the uh, open book sort of disclosure of all of their internal discussions. And we don't even debate that anymore as journalists, whether, whether it's print. private or anything. Um, I, I, one other footnote on that uh, story is my read of this is that Jim Comey, the FBI director, was moving to protect his own institution <laughs> by making or, sure and that... maybe his own legacy. Because right? if yeah. it got revealed after the election that there were additional emails yeah. and, and he hadn't said anything about it, uh, then that would trigger a whole nother round of congressional hearings and it would be at the expense of the FBI. And he's been under a lot of pressure, you know, so I'm not, I'm not totally surprised by this, but the timing is not good for the Clinton campaign. Jeff uh, Berkowitz, uh, who you can lead off the young at heart questioning. First year in the college, right, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, you, alum that from explains the, the sweater. A learn from, alum from the University of Chicago Law School and grad school in economics. Thank you so much for the introduction, David. Uh, so following, as we do here at the University of Chicago, taking ideas to their logical conclusion, following up on what was just raised about the classified issue, hasn't the media, and indeed this session, given Hillary a free pass? I mean, it's been like Fox would say, a slobbering love affair. A complete a riff on Trump, we've just heard. And all we hear about Hillary, she's got this paranoia, want of secrecy. But nobody's yeah, touched on. Sounds very flattering to me. But. Okay. but nobody's touched on really the major substantive issue of the Clintons the blending of the Clinton Foundation, Hillary Clinton in the State Department, Bill Clinton Enterprises all smushed together with major league conflicts. I mean, nobody can deny it. The Wikipedia leaks, you Jeff, can get question. To a question. So man. the question is you can question, some, you, they, they don't really question the authenticity of what we know from the Wikipedia leaks, not very much. And so the question is, if it was the case that Bill Clinton was using the foundation and the State Department as it, the example would be the Moroccans giving $12 million for Hillary to the foundation for Hillary to show up, and then she didn't. Bill making really high fees, which he would have made anyway, but argument could be made making even more so. Why aren't, the question is, why aren't the media, other than the Fox News Channel, focusing more on what I just said, and why aren't the three of you? I question, am so, question mark. I am so happy to get a question about why I'm too nice to Hillary. <laughs> because my whole book tour has been the opposite question. And um, I agree with you that, you know, and because of Trump's, you know, uh, strangeness, bizarreness in this campaign, as I say, a lot of people think Hillary should get a free pass. And I've been making the argument that Anybody who wants the most powerful job in the world cannot get a free pass, and it's possible to cover Hillary and Hillary's issues, and it's possible to cover Trump and not equate them. And um, 
I just think that, yeah, I think there is a certain school of thought that she should not be criticized right now because, as she likes to say in her closing line, she's the only thing standing between us and the abyss. But uh, the in abyss my, being bad. Yeah, and in my experience, people who get away with things don't learn their lessons. They just ratchet it up and do it more elaborately. I mean, I think we've done a lot of reporting on the foundation and a lot of stories on it. I think maybe it gets lost somewhat in the Trump stuff. We've done some of the, you know, we broke the email story, for goodness <laughs> sake. Uh, I think that the Clintons, you know, their relationship with money has been problematic for a long time, uh, going back to the commodities trade, right? And I think that some of it, you know, maybe does get lost in the craziness of this election. But I, I mean, I would say the Times has but, written a lot about the foundation. And I've been, you know, I've, I've been critical uh, of her and I've been... Yeah, they've noticed that. Yes. <laughs> but, but I will say this, um, you know, and Jeff, it was a good example of this. Um, I, I ask the same question all the time, which is, you know, uh, there's, Hillary herself said there's there's smoke but no fire, and the problem is that smoke follows them around. But for a quid pro quo to be a quid pro quo, there has to be a quid and a quo. And I keep asking uh, where the, the quo was. I mean, if, it, there's no doubt that it, it, these are unattractive stories, but at the end of the day, the implication of your question, Jeff, is that there was a payout for it. Yes, she, the, 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 the King of Morocco or whatever wanted, gave $12 million to the foundation and wanted her to show up at the event, but she didn't show up at the event. People met with Hillary Clinton who were donors to the foundation, but no one's yet written what they got in tangible reward for it. So you can't just imply or impute to them, to these stories, that there was a payoff at the end of the day. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to start a debate with you, nor am I going to give you a chance to respond. So, <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, but uh, it's the privileges of the chair. You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, but I think that's part. Of, it is true that these stories should be fully vetted. It's also true that you can't take them beyond where they lead you because you have a particular political point of view. So, having said that. Uh, we've come to the end of our time here, but I hope that you'll spend some time with Maureen and pick up her book. I will say this as a former journalist. I, I, first, let me say as someone who's been in public life, I don't always love what she writes, but uh, because sometimes it's been uh, pointed in critiquing people who I'm close to. Uh, but as a former journalist and as a aficionado of great writing, uh, we're sitting with one of the great masters of journalism of our time. So, uh, and you. And if you. If you have any doubt about it, buy this book and read it, and you'll see why. So thank you very much, Carl Hulse, Maureen Dowd, for being with us today. Thank you.